Well, day seven just ended in the Michelle Traconis trial, and we're going to catch you up from day six and day seven, because we left off after day five, and now we've had another 13 hours of court time, and therefore we've got to catch you up. So instead of you having to sit through 13 hours of court time, let me do that for you in 10 minutes. How does that sound? Good? I thought so. So let's move on. But first, something interesting actually happened is that another juror was dismissed. We already have one juror, an alternate juror, that was dismissed because of inappropriate communication that that juror had with a the prosecutor. The prosecutor did nothing wrong in this case, by the way. It was just a juror uh, saying some comments to the prosecutor in this case, and therefore the judge called that juror in and dismissed the juror. And now we have another instance of juror misconduct. And in this instance, we have juror number 186. Juror 186 went and took to social media regarding this case and was talking about this case on their social media platforms and was comparing this case with a movie called Gone Girl. And that's a big no-no. The judge always tells the jury, you're not allowed to discuss the case. You are not to discuss this case even with anybody that lives with you at home, even your wife, your husband. You're not allowed to discuss this case at all until I tell you it's time to discuss this case. So certainly that also includes going to social media and discussing this case. And also that includes watching channels like mine. So if you're a juror, stop watching this channel. I know it's very exciting and I know it's very educational and I know that you're learning more about the trial through watching my videos than you are sitting in trial all day, but still, you can't be doing that. You have to, the way the system works is that you've only got to take your information from the four walls and the four corners of that courtroom. Sorry, you can watch this afterwards and see whether you came to the right conclusion, but you can't see it now. So if you're a juror, get off of this channel and this is only for everybody else. And you can come afterwards after the trial is done. So we have juror number 186 that was dismissed. And by the way, this, this, uh, this problem is actually keeps coming up in a bunch of different trials that we keep finding different jurors that are not listening to the judge and going onto social media and discussing the case or watching channels like this it keeps coming up. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a, uh, a newer problem that we're having, but it keeps coming up and, uh, you know, there's not going to be much way to control it really, unless we sequester the jury and, and take away all their communication devices. You know, it's not really going to, ha- it's, it's not other, and there's no real, real way to control it. So anyway, so juror 186 was now dismissed. Now, let's get into some of the evidence. So, we had the blood spatter stains expert testify. He'd spent a lot of time testifying about the different analysis of the blood spots. And essentially, what he was testifying was that it looked to him, with his expertise, that number one, someone was trying to wipe away this blood. There's certain spots that it looked like someone was trying to clean up. So, that also really suggests that Fotis was there trying to clean up. And remember, that also corroborates with the testimony of the nanny that said that there was, she brought up 12 uh, paper towel rolls. And when she came in the morning, when her shift started or when she was supposed to report, there was only 10, uh, there's only two, which means that 10 got taken away or used. So what was 10 paper towel rolls being used for? Uh, the suggestion here is that Fotis was cleaning up after his mess, unfortunately. So, You've got that, number one, he was cleaning that the, all these spots were, were uh, well, some of these spots looked like they were wiped and trying to clean up. And number two is that he also was able to I, I reconstruct where these drops came from. So he was able to show how these drops came from, a, some of them splattered on the Range Rover mid-flight, and some of them were transfer stains and different things like that. But the bottom line is, is that these stains essentially did not come from running into a deer or running over a squirrel. That's not where these stains came from. So that was essentially what his testimony was, that this was, seems to have all these stains came from one spot in the garage. How did that happen? Why do you think that happened? And number two, that it seems like someone was trying to clean up after themselves. So that was essentially what his testimony was. Then we had the cell phone of Fotis that was being tracked to Albany Avenue. We had that testimony come out and it was tracked into the to that area uh, the Albany Avenue area in Hartford at 7 p.m. on May 24, 2019, and that coincidentally, that area is a high crime area. Now, that specific issue actually uh, was, there was some argument about that piece of information coming out. And the suggestion by the prosecution, well, the reason why they wanted that information to come out is because what's a person like Fotis's, Fotis doesn't belong in a, in a high crime area. He's a person of a certain stature, he's very wealthy, and it wouldn't seem seem very out of place for him to be in that area, of a high crime area. So what's he doing there? 
So that would suggest also that he's up to no good. He's trying to dispose of certain materials which are associated with crime. So that's probably also why he would want to go to a high crime area because who says it's him? Maybe there's uh, all these other crimes that are going on that are people are disposing of their of their materials also. So that was the suggestion, it seems, uh, from that testimony. So uh, on cross, in cross-examination, actually, of that witness, uh, they brought out that it's actually that street, Albany itself, is a thoroughfare to other to other highways and other streets, and there's actually a double A baseball team that plays right near there, and there's also a university that's there. So it's not completely out of place for photos to be found in that area driving around. So that was the cross examination uh, of of that specific fact about it being it being a high crime area. So then we've got also some surveillance which shows that Fotis is putting something in the drain, in the sewer drain. And not only is he putting things in garbage cans, but he's also putting something in the sewer drain. And essentially they brought some uh, some detectives or some experts that are able to bring up whatever was put in the in the sewer, and they were actually able to retrieve what was dumped in the sewer. And what was dumped in that sewer, what actually was dumped in that sewer was two license plates. And the two license plates were identical. So I know in certain states you have a license plate in the front and the back. That's what it seems to be like here in Connecticut, that they had two license plates which had the same exact license plate number. So they ran the number. Right, they, they they found the license plate. They ran the number, and it turns out that that number came back. The license plate came back registered to no one. It was non-existent. But then they realized that the numbers were actually altered. So, what the suggestion here is that Fotis actually altered the license number to appear like a different number. And when they're able to actually put the right number in, guess which. Uh, guess how it came back? It came back to r- registered uh, to a 2007 Chevy Suburban, which was originally owned by Fotis. Now, he hasn't registered it for a while, but it was originally registered to him. So what exactly was going on with that license plate, and why did he feel that he needed to dispose of it? That's not clear yet. But what is interesting is that it's able to connect Fotis to those license plates. Um, all right, so... That's essentially really what happened. You're basically caught up in the two full days of testimony. But I also want to discuss a legal issue that came up. And this defense attorney loves to object. He's objecting all over the place. And if you're somebody who wants to, I guess, learn the law, then it may be enjoyable for you. But for everybody else, it's kind of annoying because it really breaks up the trial. You can't get three questions out without an objection and without a whole argument and without a sidebar. And then before the jury comes in, there's another 20 minutes of argument and then there's motions being filed. So it kind of breaks it up and it's kind of a little bit of annoying. But there are some interesting uh, interesting legal analysis to be made. So let's let me just play for you one of the objections that were made. And we're going to jump into the legal analysis behind that and see who's right. So... Here is one of the objections that were made by the defense counsel. The motion I just filed, Your Honor, on Friday the state said it, quote, had cases, unquote, that supported the notion that what police do, they can explain their motivation and their what hearsay they hear in exchange for why they took certain action. Well, I've attached pages from uh, Judge Prescott's uh, version of the sixth edition of the Tate's Handbook of Connecticut Evidence, which is the seminal treatise on Connecticut evidence. And I and there's many cases that I have attached that are in those in that section 8.9. But the most salient comment is quote on page 515, a police officer's conduct is rarely relevant to the crime charge, and the officer should not be allowed to repeat statements made to the officer to explain why the officer did or did not do something. Well, the, the interpreter is unable to keep up, Attorney Sean Horn, with your presentation. Uh, uh, let me repeat that slowly. A police officer's conduct is rarely relevant to the crime charge, and the officer should not be allowed to repeat statements made to the officer to explain why the officer did or did not do something. Close quote. All right. So... He's saying like this. He's saying that the state wants to introduce hearsay to show why a police officer did what he did. So let's start from the beginning. The beginning is, right, the rule is that hearsay is not admissible 
to prove the matter asserted in the hearsay. So you can't say what somebody else told you in order to prove the fact of what the person is telling you. That you're not allowed to introduce hearsay. Everybody understands that. But of course, there's always all these exceptions. And one of the exceptions that the state uh, argued is that to show what you did with that information is admissible. So you're not, you're not uh, in trying to admit a hearsay statement to prove the matter asserted in the, in the hearsay statement. We're just trying to introduce it to show what the police officer did as a result of hearing that piece of information. So again, we're not introducing that to show, to prove to the, to the court, to prove to the jury that that actually happened, but we want to show what actions the police officer took because he was told that information. So that's the prosecution's argument, and the defense's argument is that that's not relevant. Even if you're technically right that that would be a hearsay exception, but it only would work if what the police officer then did is actually relevant to the case. So not just because you found an exception, not just because you found an exception to the hearsay rule can this automatically come in. Remember, when you're dealing with evidence, rules of evidence, even if you find one rule of evidence that you're able to get this evidence in, you have to think about the other rules of evidence. So you're always going to be dealing with the relevance question, and you're also always going to be dealing with the, is this information, is the probative value outweighed by the, the, the uh, danger of unfair prejudice, which we discussed also in other videos. You should certainly by now be a subscriber of this channel you know, and, and to be able to learn all this stuff. So we've already discussed that in, in some other videos, but just to briefly go over it, so you have any, any evidence that's relevant technically would fall under the something that's uh, the relevant rule, relevance rule, and would be admissible. Except if the if it's the relevance is very very small, and the the danger of unfair prejudice is very very high. So if the danger of unfair prejudice is very high, and the probative value of this relevant evidence is very very small, then also the judge can say it's not going to come in. So even though, coming back to our example, even though technically, a piece of hearsay could come in because it's not being not being offered to prove the matter asserted but and 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 it's really being offered to show what the police officer did because of that information but still you have to show that it's relevant right so that all makes sense and that's essentially what the case law says but the defense attorney quoted from a judge named judge prescott and judge prescott is a connecticut supreme court justice who authored a treatise on evidence, right? Who better to offer a treatise on evidence than Supreme Court justice? Well, you may think that, but technically, usually Supreme Court justices are not, hear, or not hearing trials. But they're good legal scholars, and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll give it to him and assume that he knows what he's talking about. So he put in his treatise the following, and this is what the defense attorney read, and we're going to discuss this based on the case law. He said the following, a police officer conducts, a police officer conducts, I'm sorry, a police officer's conduct is rarely relevant to the crime charged and the officer should not be allowed to repeat statements made to the officer to explain why the police did or did not do something. So here, the, this judge, Judge Prescott, in his treatise, is saying that police officer's conduct is rarely relevant. So it's rarely relevant and therefore, since it's rarely relevant to the crime charged, so then he should not be allowed to say what pieces of hearsay he heard which caused him to do something. Why? Because again, it's not relevant. So ignoring the hearsay problem, because this is not a hearsay problem, but it's not relevant. That's essentially what the Judge Prescott is saying. He's saying it's rarely relevant. And then, I didn't play this part, but the defense attorney also says that really this is also quoted in the case. So a treatise doesn't really have such binding authority. It's just a treatise. It's a Supreme Court justice saying what his opinion is. So it doesn't have such heavy binding authority. But a, a, an opinion does have binding precedent, right? So he, it's not, you don't, as an attorney, want to just quote a treatise. You also want to quote some case law or some statutes. So the defense attorney does quote a case. He, he talks for a lot more if you want to see that clip, but, you know, we want to be here all day. So he states, he, he quotes the case called State versus Armidar. And he, his argument is, is that State versus Armidar essentially adopts Judge Prescott's 
uh, rule about police officers' conduct being rarely relevant. But if you pull the case, actually, this is what it says. Although statements admitted to show the effect on the hearer are not hearsay, as I explained, because we're just we're introducing them to show the effect on the listener, on the person who's hearing the hearsay, they should not be admitted for that purpose unless it is clear that the hearer's state of mind or subsequent conduct is relevant. So again, it all comes back to, is it relevant? Is that hearer's state of mind or subsequent conduct or what actions they took, is that relevant to the case at hand? And then continuing, although statement was offered to show effect on hearer, this is a quote from a different case, police, the, the police officer, it was not relevant. So it quotes, quotes a different case where it shows, in that case it says, that it was not admissible, admissible because it was not relevant. So it shows some cases both ways. So the ultimate question really comes down to is these statements that these police officers are hearing and therefore conducting certain investigations and therefore pulling certain surveillance cameras and therefore seeing certain vehicles that photos owned and therefore trying to track these vehicles that photos owned. Is that ultimately relevant to prove the, the to prove the charge that is going to the charge which is against Michelle Terconis? And the answer is absolutely, of course it is. This is all relevant. This is all, you have to set the foundation in order to show how Michelle Tricornis was involved with FOTUS. But first you've got to show all this stuff about FOTUS and then we're going to connect it to Michelle Tricornis. So the question is, are all these statements that the police officers hear from each other which help them conduct their investigation, which helped eventually lead to Michelle Tricornis, is that relevant? Of course it is. So the judge certainly, like I said, the judge followed the, 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 the law and said, yes, it's a nice argument that defense is making, and it's an interesting quote from Judge Prescott, but really, since all of this information is relevant, their conduct, certainly at the initial stages of the investigation, is relevant, so therefore he's going to allow the, that hearsay in to show what the police officers did with that information. So that, what I thought, was another interesting part of this trial, and we will continue keeping you updated. That's it for today. Please, if you haven't yet, subscribe, like the video, and we will see you next time.